Thank you for watching. It is May 22nd, and I am looking forward to this week. It's a it's an exciting week in the time uh, that we have. Uh, sorry, it's just an exciting week in terms of uh, Jewish festivals and traditions and 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 everything that happens in the New Testament surrounding uh, the giving of the Holy Spirit. So uh, this week is is a preparation for the Festival of Weeks, or also known as Shavuot, uh, and it is uh, the time when it, it commemorates the original festival, uh, which is you know it's still uh, doing uh, comm commemorates the time when. Uh, God met with the people of Israel at Mount Sinai, and and Moses received the Ten Commandments. Uh, and so it's like, you know, we had Passover, and then he had several weeks later, about seven weeks later, it's seven times so yeah, seven weeks later, it's forty nine days. Uh, fifty on the fiftieth day is the celebration. Uh, but it's, um, you know, again, that time when when Moses received the Torah, when he received the word from God, the this the. the the written scripture um, that was put down on tablets and everything else. And then uh, when you look at the New Testament, you see the sacrifice of Jesus, which occurred on Passover. And then exactly that seven week period ended and it was time for festival of weeks. Shavuot, uh, then, and the disciples and everyone were gathered uh, together at the temple and the spirit came down. Uh, so, uh, and and which is the word of God, right? The spirit of God, and then they started speaking and in and sharing the good news with the people that were there and everything else. So, really cool event, and it's commemorated. Uh, the the date for it is this weekend, I think, on the twenty eighth. The twenty seventh is the eve of Shabbat. And so I started read, or sorry, not Shabbat, Shavuot. And so I started to read uh, some of the portions yesterday to familiarize myself with the material, and so. I think uh, definitely we'll get into it uh, later this week. For now, we're going to finish up the I am statements in John. Uh, today, we're going to cover two because they they go together. Uh, they're they're taught hand in hand by Jesus. They're 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 stated by Jesus. I just wanted to make uh, mention. Uh, you know, the reason why these I am statements are considered to be significant is because of how. God revealed himself to Moses in that burning bush. If you remember him saying, I am who I am, when when Moses asked, uh, who should I say sent to me? You know, I got I feel like I have a, a sneeze. It's like about to come out. But uh, and Jesus. Whew, all right. Hit the mute button. So. I think I saved myself there, but uh, so in God's response to Moses was tell them I am who I am, right? And that's where we get the the name, the name Yahweh, uh, and and so that's why these I am statements are considered to be a significant part of John's writing, uh, because Jesus is showing to his audience and teaching to them, and John is showing to his audience that Jesus is God and that God. Um, is it's possible for God to be incarnate, you know, and which is a challenge, right? It's always a challenge. Uh, you know, it's like, how do we deal with this whole, like he's one God and yet there's three persons and he, Jesus and the spirit and all this stuff. And, and it is, it is a challenge to like wrap our heads around all that stuff. Uh, and what John is doing is trying to present to us like the ways that Jesus made the claims and how he identified himself as the son of God. And, and, and part of that is using these I am statements, right? And if you remember the point of all the signs was to show us that Jesus is the son of God and he's the king of Israel. And now with the I am statements, uh, they are further clarifications on exactly who he is, but also linking his existence to concepts and and fulfillments of of ideas from from the from the Tanakh or the the old what we call the old testament and so we're going to really see that highlighted today we've already looked at i am the bread of life and the connection to the manna in in uh in the in the old testament and then we saw that i am the light of the world and we saw the the sections uh of prophecy um where 
you know, Jesus talks about, or God talks about the light of nations coming. And now we're going to be looking at, I am the gate and I am the good shepherd. Okay. I am the gate and I am the good shepherd. But for a little bit of context, we're going to start in, in John chapter nine. Sorry, so if you want to follow along, John chapter nine, we're reading, starting at verse 35. And if you remember this story, uh, we, we covered it last week or, or the week before the the story of the man who was born blind and was healed and so this is the the end of that story and uh so john 39 35 it says yeshua heard that they had thrown him out finding him he said do you believe in the son of man uh the man answered who is he sir tell me that i may um believe in him and if you remember from our study back then that was the that's the reference on a man daniel chapter 7 so this is a a messianic reference and and so the man just innocently says, who is he? And, and, and in that story, like he was healed from his blindness, but he never saw Jesus. Jesus put mud on his eyes, and then he went and washed his eyes in the pool of Siloam. And then he had his eyes saved back, but he never saw the person who healed him. And so he's that's being revealed to him now. And Yeshua said, you have seen him. He is the one speaking with you. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshiped him. Now, at this moment, you know the way John writes. Uh, there's there's constant like there's breaks sometimes that if you're not familiar with like some of the phrasing, the timing of festivals, things like that, you might think that or or even geography, you might think that it's just like one thing after the other. But remember, his gospel is covering three three years of time. But in this situation, it does feel like everything is still happening in this one setting, and so. I find it interesting, and I like to imagine that this man starts to worship him, and he's probably at Jesus' feet worshiping him. That's how my imagination goes, right? I don't know what exactly how he worshiped. If he was just like, "Oh, praise God," and he walks away, or what? But then I like to imagine that he's there at Jesus' feet worshiping, worshiping him. That's just kind of where my imagination likes to go. And in verse thirty-nine, Yeshua says. For judgment I came into this world so that those who don't see may see and the ones who do see may become blind. And some of the Pharisees who were with him heard him and said that, heard him say this and asked, We're not blind too, are we? And Yeshua said to them, If you are blind, you have no sin. But now you say we see, so your sin remains. Now, like I said, I in my imagination, I like to think that this guy is there, you know, worshiping Jesus and this whole this conversation starts up. Right now, logically, you know, if this was happening, the, they might have said like, hey, why is this guy worshiping you? So you know, they might have stopped it anyway. I still like to imagine. This guy is there with his Messiah. He's been bo- he was born blind, then for years he's healed. He's been thrown out of the community anyway. Right. He's been thrown out by the Pharisees that happened just prior to to reading this passage. And now he's kind of at his feet, at the feet of his savior, at the one who brought him his sight. And Jesus is using this back and forth to explain that, you know, I came and so that people like him can see. And and so people like you will remain blind. And that is the theme now for the next two I am's. The difference between Jesus and the current leadership. Okay. The uh, difference between the two of them. So the teaching continues. Now here... You know, you're, all of our Bibles separate this into a new chapter, chapter 10. Uh, but it's I think it's very clear that he's this. This is all still happening in the same setting. Okay? Uh, not just because of feeling, but also looking at the text and seeing the evidence of, of what's written there. So it says in, in verse 1 of chapter 10, Amen, amen. I tell you, he who does not enter the sheepfold by the door, but climbs some other way, is a thief and a robber. So the first way that jesus describes these blind pharisees these blind leaders he describes them as thieves and robbers okay thieves and robbers later on he's gonna he's going to describe them as hired hands and wolves okay so uh there's like four different descriptions there but the ideas are that are are all inner intertwined together so there's thieves and robbers in verse two he who enters through the door is the shepherd of the sheep. So now here comes another figure into this picture. You have thieves, you have robbers, you have a shepherd. To him, the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice. 
the shepherd hears his own sheep by name and leads them out. So all of this can be confusing without understanding how it works with sheep and everything else. And I don't have personal experience, like a lot of personal experience with sheep other than like petting zoos. Uh, my uncle used to have goats, uh, like a couple of them. And so I definitely, <laughs> I just, just, I'm laughing because of how, you know, they would just like headbutt you from behind. You just like walking around goats would just headbutt you. They just come up from behind and headbutt you in the butt. Like, and you're just like, what, what was that about? Um, but apparently, so doing some reading, right, commentaries, and also just from teaching experience that was gained by from others who have worked with sheep. Okay, so putting all this information together, uh, when and and you can see it here in the text when the shepherd goes to take care of a sheep to lead them out to pasture, right? Because because that's what shepherds need to do. Uh, sheep are not the smartest kind of animal and that's kind of why it's like it's it, out in society today people are like insulted uh by the phrase like you're just sheep because the implication is you're just dumb and you just listen to whatever people tell you right um and for the most part like sheep are actually in, they're intelligent but they can get easily distracted okay they can get easily distracted uh by what when it comes to eating they can get easily distracted. And so shepherds have to make sure they lead them to a safe place to pasture, right? Because they the sheep can go and once they find food, they start eating and then they stop paying attention to their surroundings. One of the things I learned through someone who took care of sheep was that a sheep would literally eat itself off a cliff because it's so distracted by the food. And it's eating and eating, eating, keeping its head down. It doesn't notice it's at an edge and it'll walk right off. Okay, so one of the things that a shepherd has to do is make sure that it's safe enough in that sense that there's no edges. And if there are, the shepherd needs to go by the edge and make sure that he shoes them away so that they don't fall off the edge, right? They can eat too much food, uh, too much, and so they get bloated. Um, and so that's not good for them, right? And we usually count on each other to make sure, you know, count, you count on yourselves, I should say, to make sure you don't eat too much, right? Like, if you've ever had that moment, you're like, oh, man, I ate too much. And it's just like, oh, why'd you do that, right? And sheep would, can do that all the time, and they get bloated and gassy, and they get very uncomfortable. And the shepherd has to sit next to them and rub their bellies and massage the gas out and stuff like that so they can feel better. And so, you know, sheep need a lot of care. They they won't notice, a, they may not notice a predator, right? That's one of the big things. They won't notice a predator who's right there because they're so distracted eating. And so that's, you know, uh, part of what a shepherd has to do is to make sure they go out to a safe place to pasture and that they're, that they're protected from the cells, basically. Uh, and so when he does that, a shepherd goes to wherever the sheep are kept. And if he's got a hired hand who's, who's there, opens the door, whatever, he's like, hey, open the door. They open the door, and then he calls them. And what's really cool about sheep is that they learn the sound, the voice of their shepherd, and they own, they will identify with that shepherd, and they will only follow that shepherd. So the shepherd can go to the door, open the door, have the door open, and call them to himself. And I, I usually would show like this. There's like these great YouTube video about where these people are trying to call these sheep, and these sheep are like not responding, and then the shepherd calls the sheep. And immediately they start bleeding. They lift their heads up. It's like such a cute video. I it just, it's hard to, uh, you know, I probably could do it here, but it's just like the whole setup thing. Um, I might just put it in description on YouTube, just a link. Yeah, I'll do that. I'll put a, a link to the description. So you can watch that on YouTube. Uh, but that's how sheep are when it comes to the shepherds and hearing their, his voice. And so when a thief or robber comes, you notice here in verse 1, uh, he does not enter the sheepfold by the door. Be, and mainly because there's someone usually there who's guarding the door, right? But he climbs in some other way because he's a thief and a robber, right? So anyone who doesn't come in through the door is doing that because they don't want to deal with what's at the door. That's usually someone who's watching it. And so they find, or maybe there's a lock and key in there. They got to, they got to, you know, it's, you, it's, it's not the easiest way to come in the gate. Sometimes you got to find another way in. So Jesus is saying, anybody who comes in outside of there is a thief and a robber. But 
the one who comes through the door is a shepherd and to the doorkeeper, right? So he gives and the sheep and he leads them out. Now, when he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will never follow a stranger, but run away with him, for they do not know the voice of strangers. And another reason why a, sh- a thief or a robber won't even bother with the door, really, is because if they did, like they open the door and they start calling on the sheep, the sheep won't listen to them. The sheep won't follow them. So what they have to do is they have to, they have to grab the sheep themselves by hand and carry what they can. Uh, and so Yeshua, it says that Yeshua told them this parable, but they didn't understand what what he was telling them. So he starts to make a couple of clarifications. Okay, so Yeshua said to them, said again, Amen, Amen. I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Okay, so the gate represents a spot that, you know, where the sheep exit and enter, you know, their safe place and they go out to pasture and it represents the pathway for someone who belongs. Right. So uh, he said earlier, the thief and the robber does not enter in by the gate. Right. And and I said before, because they may not have the, the, the key to open the gate or there might be a hired hand there. So they got to find another way in but if you're walking in through the gate then you're they're an approved person right and then you're also someone that the sheep are going to recognize and so he says makes it clear i am the gate for the sheep so i am the doorway i am the i am the lock and key i am and i am the access okay and all those verse 8 who came before me are thieves and robbers but the sheep did not listen to them so the thieves and robbers came in uh, they didn't come in through the door. They didn't come in through through Jesus. They didn't come in through Yeshua and everything that he represents. They came in in some other way, and then they tried to call the sheep out. And they tried to call the sheep and say, come, follow me, and everything else. But so the sheep did not listen to them. Okay? I am the gate. If anyone comes in through me, he will be saved. He will come and go find pasture. So what does the thief do if if those who... Uh, they're calling to that that they won't listen to them. The verse ten: the thief only comes to steal, slaughter, and destroy. Okay. So once a thief realizes that the sheep in the pasture won't follow them, right? They won't just walk out with them. Then they just, like I said earlier, they just have to carry what they can. They grab a couple of sheep, or maybe they kill some. They they take the if they have time, whatever. But they have to. They have to, by force, remove what they can from from the flock, uh, and and we actually see that in in the story that led up to this this teaching uh, and this confrontation, where the man who's born blind, um, you know, he's being questioned and he's being interrogated about how he was healed and everything else, and so he goes into uh, this this council of of the leadership and they they interrogate him further and he doesn't succumb to the the force uh that they're that they're pushing on him to declare that jesus is some evil guy or to admit that he was that he was you know always had his sight and he's pretending and so jesus is fake uh and he's faking these miracles or whatever the pressure might be he didn't succumb to it right and so they end up they end up succ- kicking him out of their community. And so he's he's a representation of sh- a, sh- a sheep that belongs to Jesus uh, and also one that the thieves then tried to steal from Jesus, right? But they couldn't do it. So then uh, they can slaughter him or they can destroy him. One of, uh, and, and so they destroy him by kicking him out of the community. When you get kicked out of the community, I mentioned this before, talking about the community thing, but just to reiterate, this isn't like, okay, you're excommunicated from a church in the sense that like you can't come here anymore, then you could just go find another church. You know, when we left our, our, when I, we left my home church, uh, it wasn't because of anything I did wrong is because of, of stuff that was going on there and that was abusive. And so we left and uh, I never felt though that I was put out of the Christian community. Like I just went to another church and a lot of people do that today. Uh, and just you just go to another church, but I don't want you to think about it this that way. You know that way is it's not like he it, when when they took him out of their synagogue when he, they took him out of the community, 
they took him out of the only place where he could fellowship. I mean, it's like it's like revoking a membership to life. Uh, it's 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 like going to weddings and dinners and parties, and and that was part of what we experienced too. When we leave a church, like like literally nobody came to ask, like, hey, what happened? Where are you guys going? Why didn't you guys come back? Uh, nobody uh, reached out. I mean, there are very few people, pretty much other people that also kind of left and were on the fringes of the church were the only ones that let me know, like, hey, so-and-so died. You want to go to the funeral? And just like, you know what? It's really sad. I love the guy, but he's dead. And the other people there are, you know, the same people I had to leave and haven't reached out. So I guess, yeah, I won't come. So in a way, there was like this, and there was this, you know, separation from the community. And it destroys you. You know, it was like the sense of my, ch- I grew up there. I was a kid growing up there. So it was just like, um, and, and so I can go to another church and I can feel like oh, I'm still part of the community community, but it's not the same thing. But just imagine if that happens, you know, people die, there's weddings, there's, there's parties, there's just living life, like I said, and you can't go to it. And then you also can't just go somewhere else. The only other option would be to follow uh, like a Greek god, go worship, you know, um, Ares or something, or, or you know, just like do something else. Like, and that's just crazy. And find a community there in the worship of another god. That's crazy, right? And so they sought to destroy him. And and then they can also steal. So the thief can come steal, sorry, steal, slaughter, destroy. So they try to pull people into their own flock. Like, you come follow me and try to retrain that sheep to follow their voice. Or they destroy the sheep altogether. Or they can slaughter the sheep. And that's what they plan to do with Lazarus. If you remember, after Lazarus was raised from the dead, their idea was, you know, we got to, not only do we need to kill Jesus, but we need to kill Lazarus too because he's walking around. Everybody could see like he's alive, and they and he was dead for four days, so we need to kill him. And so that's that's Jesus again. The point of these I am just to describe the difference between himself and the leadership at at that's currently there. And then uh, Jesus says in verse eleven. Or sorry, verse the second half, verse ten. I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. So he's comparing what they're doing. They're they're trying to steal, slaughter, destroy. He's there to give life and to give it abundantly, just like with the blind man. He gave his eyes back. Like now the guy can, the guy doesn't have to beg anymore. He can do something. He can work. He can live. Uh, he can he can get married. He can have children. Like it's just like crazy. Like he really did give him life and gave it abundantly. Uh, and that's that's the difference between the two shepherds. And in verse 11, uh, he says, I am the good shepherd. So he started with, I am the gate. Like, I am the way in and out of this flock. So you've got to come through me. So if anybody who's coming into this situation, whether as a leader, a hired hand or whatever, you got to come in through me. He establishes that. Now he says, I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And this is where he begins here to foretell his own sacrifice. But he makes another distinction. So the hired worker. Now, this is someone who does enter into the gate, but someone who's different from the shepherd. So the hired worker is not the shepherd and the sheep are not his own. He sees the wolf coming and abandons the sheep and flees. Then the wolf snatches and scatters the sheep. So now, and, and don't, don't miss the point there where he says a shepherd lays down his life for a sheep. And so he's, he's I believe... He's pointing to the idea that he is our shepherd, right? He is our good shepherd, and he's going to lay us lay down his feet, and we're going to know his voice, and we're going to follow him. He's going to lead us to the pasture. But in this realm of existence, in this analogy, there are also going to be people that are hired uh, to work the sheep, to help take care of the sheep, okay? Uh, and he's, But he says, just to distinguish, like, they're not the shepherd, so they're not, they're not, In terms of like their commitment to the sheep, the hired worker is not going to be there at that level of commitment. Okay. The hired worker is someone who's there to do a job, but when situations arise where they're 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 put in a place where they're challenged and they have to protect the sheep, they're more likely to abandon the sheep. And that's why he gives the analogy of the wolf. And I think the wolf is another. Uh, 
it's a callback to the thief and robber. It's to the Pharisees, to those who are outside of the, the, the shepherd's fold who try to come and steal. And they do the same thing, right? Wolf snatches and scatters the sheep. And so a wolf comes to destroy a flock and comes to steal from the flock and, and to slaughter sheep. And so he's the same as the robber or the thief, right? And so in verse 13, he clarifies, says, the man is only a hired hand and does not care about the sheep. He says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the father knows me and I know the father, I lay down my life for my sheep. I have other sheep that are not from this fold. Those also I must lead and they will listen to my voice. So there shall be one flock and one shepherd. For this reason, the father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it up again. No one takes it away from me, but I lay it down on my own. And I have the authority to lay it down and I have the authority to take it up again. This command I received my, from my father. I don't want to miss the idea that Jesus is linking his status as shepherd with his the sacrifice of himself. In order for someone to be a shepherd, a good shepherd, that's the level of commitment they have to commit to. The sacrifice of themselves for the sake of the betterment of their sheep. You know, when, when the wolf comes to attack, when the lion comes, you know, when we read these stories about David back in the Old Testament and David was taking care of sheep and he's a young man and a lion attacked and he killed the lion. But you're putting your life at risk to go fight a lion. It's like, it's awesome. Well, I fight that. But how many shepherds went and fought a lion and then died? Uh, because they, they laid down their life for their sheep. And that's what he's talking about because this is the level I'm going to go to. And for this reason, the father has approved his ministry, has given him the signs to show to everybody that he belongs to the father and has declared his love for his son because his son is doing that. His son sees the same wolf that that the father sees and the son says, I'm going to go down in front of that wolf and I'm going to lay down my life to protect my sheep from them. Because, you know, once the wolf gets a shepherd, the wolf is probably going to leave the sheep away leave the sheep alone i should say for a little bit while they eat you know the shepherd just like practically speaking you know they don't just go kill everything and then just have like food everywhere they probably just you know i got the shepherd like and they'll they'll pull the shepherd in and and that's it they're done uh the shepherd may have lost his life but he saved the life of his sheep and the biggest difference between our shepherd our spiritual shepherd and a shepherd who dies at the hand of a wolf who's attacking is our spiritual shepherd could not only lay down his life, but also take it back up, right? So he could rise again. So that's like a whole nother level there. Uh, while we're looking at this, I, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, miss the fact that this concept of good shepherd and the fold that he's going to bring together is believe, and I'm not the only one of the commentators believe is a direct reference to two passages specifically in the book of Ezekiel. So we're going to move to the book of Ezekiel. And in the book of Ezekiel, we're going to see the same concept about shepherds has already been preached and taught to the people of Israel. And now this was happening during the uh, Babylonian uh, capture and so that's Ezekiel chapter 1. You see the, the setting of that. And one of the saddest things about Ezekiel 4, four especially for Israelites as they're reading this, the, the, the prophecy of Ezekiel, is that Ezekiel has a vision of God leaving the temple. So he basically left Jerusalem. And the reality is that uh, there's no real indication that he ever goes back there. You know, the same way he did when, when Solomon dedicated the temple and it says that the robe of, of god like filled the temple and his glory and everything else so it seemed like god was really going to be there and it, we had in the book of ezekiel we can see you can see that that ezekiel sees this leave this presence leave and yet the you know the ones who are still there they're still doing what they can sacrifices everything else and uh things get really bad uh but here in ezekiel chapter 34 ezekiel prophesies and that's he tells what god says to him uh and it's always through a human filter right so god gives him a message and then he he uh shares that message as best as he can through his words which is why if you read ezekiel chapter one like the description of whatever it was that he saw god was sitting on is 
pretty crazy. But he says, the word of the Lord Adonai came to me saying, son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy against the shepherds. Of, so he's talking about the, the current leaders in Israel. Prophesy and say to the shepherds, thus says Adonai Elohim. Oi. Well, I really like this version. It's, it's I love the way that they, they write this stuff to hold on to some of the heritage. Oi, shepherds of Israel who only take care of themselves. Should shepherds not take care of the sheep? You eat the fat. You clothe yourselves with wool. You kill the fat ones. But you do not take care of the sheep. You do not strengthen the weak, heal the sick, bind up the broken, bring back the stray, or seek the lost. Instead, you have ruled over them with force and cruelty. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. Do you remember, like, God set up the system System where he was supposed to be the leader and the, the the shepherd of Israel, and yet the people came and they're like, "Oh, we want to have a king like everyone else." And so God's like, "Okay, fine, but now that basically like that guy is going to be your shepherd." And it started with Saul, and it had David, and he had Solomon, and he had Rehoboam, and then you had and you had and then you had the split with Jeroboam, and then you had like two kings of two different nations, and it was Solomon who introduced the worship of other gods into the society, and he was a shepherd, right? And now we're at this point in their history where the, the nation's been taken over and everything seems to have been lost. And he says in verse, like he says in verse 5, they became food for all the beasts of the field as they were scattered, speaking about all the other nations. And my sheep wandered through the, all the mountains on every high hill over all the face of the earth. My sheep were scattered. No one searched. No one sought. Therefore, shepherds, hear the word of Adonai. As I live, it is a declaration of Adonai. As surely as my sheep become prey and my sheep become food for all the beasts of the field, because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherd search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my sheep. It's just repeating what he just heard. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of Adonai. Thus says Adonai Elohim. Behold, I am against the shepherds, and I will demand my flock from their hand, and I will dismiss them from tending the flock. The shepherds will no longer feed themselves. I will rescue my sheep from their mouths, so they will not be food for them. Just for time, I'm going to stop there. But you can continue reading, and you continue to see that God is declaring, I am going to return as the shepherd for my flock. And this is why when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, the idea is the good shepherd, the shepherd that is, does things appropriately and takes care of his sheep, not like the shepherds that are described there in the book of Ezekiel. Uh, and um, and so that's what um, that's what Jesus is referring to. I think it's very clear. I'm not the only one, but you have to like see the connection there and you have to read that and you have to know that this is what John is doing. His audience, remember... They read the Torah on a weekly basis and on a yearly cycle. And so, uh, and it was part of the education system. It was, it was the religious system. It was going to Sabbath. Uh, it wasn't, it wasn't optional. It was something that was read out loud. So you go to synagogue and then you, they, they, and remember these are people that are, that are oppressed. And, and, and so, you know, when they go to synagogue, it's like where they can hold on to their culture the strongest, right? So they go there. It's like, oh, their religious practices, the Romans are going to bother them. So they go there, synagogue, and the Torah is being read and everything else. And so they were familiar with that. And for him to say, and then the Pharisees especially, right, they they study these things. Uh, and then for Jesus to say, I'm the good shepherd, they are going to understand exactly what that is because they're going to have, they're going to, they're, they've been preaching and teaching this idea about the good shepherd for years now, centuries. Um, and then in verse 15, I should say verse 16, Jesus says, I have other sheep that are not from this fold. Those also I must lead and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock and one shepherd. Now, a lot of people make this to be about Gentiles, about the nations, like people like me, that this is a direct reference to Jesus saying he's going to bring in other nations into this fold. Uh, but if if we're honest about the the context and the connection to Ezekiel, we can see honestly that right now 
the Gentiles and the nations aren't part of this conversation. Okay, Right now, this is a reference to Ezekiel. And this is a reference to the concept of a good shepherd that we saw in Ezekiel chapter 34. In Ezekiel chapter 37, there is this passage about the reunification of Israel that we need to look at. And I've, I've read I've looked at it before, but we're going to actually read it this time. Uh, and so it's Ezekiel chapter 37, starting in verse 15. And if you remember, then when the Assyrians first attacked and they first came in, they captured the northern kingdom of Israel. And they did this assimilation type thing where they, they take the women and they have children with them. They intermingle them with their own people. And, and they do the same thing with the men. It's like, here's our women. And, and so the Assyrians' way of conquering was to, to completely assimilate and blend in, literally blend in people together. Babylonians were like, we're going to, we'll keep it separate. You're you, we're us. These are your people. This is our people. We're just going to take the best for you have and use them for our own purposes. Right? Daniel. Um, and so by the time we're in Jesus's time, the northern part of Israel, everyone's blended in. And the people in Judea had a tendency to look at them as the Samaritans, the, the mixed blood people, right? Not really Jewish. That's what is happening. And so in verse 15, the prophecy, going back to Ezekiel chapter 37, says, The word of Adonai came to me saying, You, son of man, take one stick and write on it for Judah, for B'nai Israel joined with him. This is for the children of, of, uh, children of Israel. So one stick with Judah. Then take another stick and write on it for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim and all the house of Israel joined with him. Join them one to another for yourself as one stick so they may become one in your hand. So you have this representation. Here's Judah and here's all the other kingdoms represented by Ephraim and, and Joseph's um, son. Uh, one of his sons. When the children of your people speak to you saying, won't you tell us what you mean by these? Say to them, thus said Adonai, Elohim, behold, I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim and the tribes of Israel joined with him, and I will put them together with the stick of Judah and make them one stick. They will be one in my hand. The sticks that you write on will be in your hand before their eyes. So it's like this miracle is going to happen where Ezekiel writes on these sticks and then they're going to, he's going to put them together and they're going to become one one branch, one stick, right? Then say to them, says Adonai, Behold, I will take B'nai Israel from among the nations. Where they have gone, I will gather them from every side and bring them into their own land. I will make them one nation in one land on the mountains of Israel, and one king will be king to them all, or a shepherd. They will no longer be two nations and never again be divided into two kingdoms, they will never again be defiled with their idols, their detestable things, or with any other transgressions. I will save them out of all their dwellings which they have sinned. I will purify them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. My servant David will be king over them. They will have one shepherd. And he continues from there. This is what Jesus is referring to in verse 15. Six, in verse 16. Uh, I have... Other sheep that are not from this fold, this fold, speaking of you, Judeans, remember, he's there in the south, uh, and those also I must lead, and they will listen to my voice, so there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Direct reference, again, to Ezekiel chapter 37, verse 24. And the quoting of Ezekiel is also significant, or the references to it uh, in John's gospel, because, again, these are... This gospel is believed to be focused, written towards the Samaritan Jews, to those who have been assimilated. And the book of Ezekiel is like one of the greatest books of prophecy for them because it shows, as we just read, that they are not forgetting but God, that he is going to bring them back together, that he is going to reunify them. And when Jesus says that I have many that are, are in the, I should say, in Ezekiel, when it says that they're, they're scattered throughout the nation, it's called the diaspora. And that speaks to how the disciples went out to share the gospel. They sought out Jewish synagogues in different places, like like Paul 
uh, at Berea. That's like the famous example of Paul and Berea in Acts chapter 17, where he goes to synagogue, he tells them about the Messiah, about how Jesus is the Messiah. And then it says that they study the scriptures on their own. They're like, okay, we're going to study this. We're going to study what you're teaching us from our scriptures and see if it holds water. And and then they believe. And so there's a big subsection in in our movement, in the in our denomination, the Plymouth Brethren, that they, they like to equate themselves with the with the Bereans, uh, those who, you know, they hear something like, okay, I'm going to go study this and see if this is true, not just take someone's word for it. And uh, I hope, I hope everyone I teach does the same thing. I tell my students always, I've always told them, hey, whatever I say from scripture, whatever you say, like we're going to check each other. And, and I think this is the, the teaching here. I think this is very clear uh, what Jesus is doing. He's, he's saying, um, and again, the 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 idea of the guy worshiping his feet this whole time—that's just my imagination. That's where my my imagination goes. I don't know if that—I don't think that's really supported, but that's just where my mindset is. But whatever it is, Jesus is there. He's he's just received worship from this man who's torn, turned blind, who was born blind, I say, and was now healed. And he makes a comment about how he came here to. Give sight to the blind, and then for the for those who think they see to realize that they are blind. The Pharisees ask him, we're blind? And then he goes into this explanation to them to explain how, yes, they are blind because they, they can't hear his voice. They can't hear his voice because they don't belong to his flock. They don't belong to his sheep. At best, they are hired hands who are there. Uh, to take care of the sheep, but there's serious deficiency deficiency in their commitment to taking care of the people. As soon as trouble comes, they flee. Or, at worst, they are the trouble that come. They are the trouble that comes, uh, and they come to steal flock from the Good Shepherd to try to bring it into their own flock. They slaughter the, the flock, and they see the flock that doesn't belong to them. They kill them, like they planned to do at Lazarus after he was raised from the dead and or they come to destroy them they come to destroy their lives they come to take away everything from them that that belongs to them uh as kind of a punishment uh for for being a member of the flock of jesus and i want to go back to ezekiel chapter 34 and i want to look at at verse seven, because it spoke to me, and because of what I, what I, the spirit spoke to me through, and because of what I was sharing earlier, um, there is judgment for those shepherds who do not take, or those who call themselves shepherds, I should say, because right now in this established society, like of community of of Yeshua, we don't have shepherds; we have one shepherd. Uh, the idea of what we have out there now taking care of us is kind of like the hired hand or a sheepdog. You know, I, I like the picture of a sheepdog. A sheepdog is is someone who's supposed to a sheepdog. If you ever maybe I'll find a video and put that in the description too. But a sheepdog is supposed to do exactly what the uh, shepherd tells them. And there's this really uh, there was this viral video that went out of these sheep that were stuck. They couldn't get up this ramp to enter into a pen. Because at the very, at the entrance of the pen, it was going up a ramp. And then at the entrance, uh, a couple of sheep got stuck together. So then all the other sheep are like trying, are behind it, trying to get up. And it's just traffic jam, right? And so the shepherd directs the sheepdog, like, go, go fix that, whatever the command was. And the, the dog runs on the backs of the sheep because the sheep, it's like a, it's like a, path it's a, a ramp that only two sheep can go side by side on and he runs up their backs up to the two that are stuck at the front and he with his mouth he gets one to go through and the other one and then they just start to go through that's so what a sheep dog is supposed to do and a sheep dog you know with the wolves around can pr actually protect the, the sheep and everything else at the direction of of the shepherd and so that's kind of what we're supposed to have today um Sheepdogs, but instead, a lot of church leaders think of themselves as the shepherd. The problem is, they're not willing to lay down their lives for their sheep. Instead, they're more likely to do what 
Jesus, or sorry, what Ezekiel prophesies about here, what God says about the shepherds of Israel. It says, as I live, is, this is verse 8, is a declaration of Adonai, as surely as my sheep became, became prey, right? So whatever might have been happening in the church with me, I, I was becoming a target, right? Whether it was like a spiritual thing, the enemy was like, oh, we're going to target this guy. Or if it was a fleshly thing, and it was like a human thing where people within the church like were targeting me, whatever. Doesn't matter. I became prey. And my sheep became food for all the beasts of the field because there was no shepherd, nor did my shepherd search for my flock. But the shepherds fed themselves and did not feed my sheep. And that's where it spoke to me. It says the, the shepherds didn't shepherd, didn't search because we were scattered, right? Didn't come. And I'd say up front that, you know, I was apologized to, but still, that's what happened. And um they fed themselves and did not feed their sheep and so i know this is supposed to be meant to help the scriptures and and so we looked at the scriptures now a little bit of mental health you're not crazy if you think that the leaders in your church don't really care about you you're not crazy if you think that you're not crazy if you think that they Pretty much only care about themselves. Uh, there's a really great book by Diane Langberg called Redeeming Power and Abuse. Uh, and it's got a long title, but it's Redeeming Power and Abuse. And it's about spiritual abuse in, a, in the church. And in it, she really perfectly lays out an explanation as to why shepherds get this way. First of all, they're not supposed to be shepherds, right? But they think of themselves that way. Even the word pastor is to mean shepherd and everything else. And it's just... Uh, a misunderstanding of of a, a economy of sheep, a system and a culture. But um, you're not crazy if you think that. You're not crazy if you feel like there are people, even leadership in your church, who are like kind of out to get you. You're not crazy if you think that you're not safe in a place, uh, because a lot of shepherds aren't trying to protect their sheep. They are there to protect the pen they're there to protect the pasture they worry more about the greenness of the grass of their fields and the wood on their barn and the paint and 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 how that looks rather than what uh who lives in it and who's being cared for in it and if an occasional sheep goes wandering away or scattered because of because a predator came in a shepherd doesn't take the time to go and find them because they've got plenty of other sheep to look for. Jesus asked, like, how many of you wouldn't leave the 99 to go get the one, right? My experience, a lot of them would leave, not leave the 99. They would let the one go and just be like, all right, I got my 99 still. And so you're not crazy for that. And, uh, you know, I've, I've heard other people kind of put down the idea, you leave a church or whatever. Uh, certainly we, we did that and we went somewhere else and, and so maybe bias in that sense, but what we were searching for every time we went someplace was a safe place for our family, for leadership that did not consider themselves shepherds, but instead considered themselves sheepdogs that are there to do the will and the command of their good shepherd. And really, it's like ultimately, it's like, do you believe that you have one shepherd, that we all have the same shepherd and you're going to follow him? That's what we were looking for. And we did find that, you know, but it was online. And, and, and so we ended up going back to the original church because we heard things have changed there. And so now we're kind of this like a testing period to see what the leadership is like. Have they returned to what I remember when I was growing up? With certain leadership have they returned to the concept that there is only one good shepherd and for my own mental health like it's it was important to learn that i could leave and walk away i used to just sit there and just take it take the abuse and whatever and it was so bad for me just the anxiety and depression sadness and the pain and the self-doubt and the anger was big the shame and uh finally had like separate myself and learn, okay, how to heal from all that. And then to come back into it 
with eyes wide open and to say, I'm here. I know who my shepherd is. I am wondering if this flock belongs to him. I'm wondering if the people here are hired hands that are working or are they thieves and robbers? Um, and if they are hired hands, are they dedicated like a sheepdog would be? Or are they dedicated like someone who is going to run away once there's trouble, right? Um, and now I know that my shepherd never left me. My shepherd always stayed with me. So while people on this earth may have failed to seek after me, the whole reason why Jesus came to lay down his life for his sheep was so that we wouldn't have to his sheep would no longer have to deal with shepherds who run away. And so if anything, my commitment to my good shepherd is stronger and I could care less what humans and their authority have to do because I've seen it in action and they fail. The reason why I say say care less because for my own mental health, I have to. If I care about what they're doing and what they're saying and how they lead, then it's just going to lead to more abuse and more and and or pain. Uh, and so it's better, better to trust the one good shepherd and to know that a good man, a good leader is, is happy with that. And is just there to do the will of the father and not control the sheep of God. So, uh, you know, that's, that's everything that we're looking at, um, why we're back at the church in case you're wondering, but <laughs> I don't know who would be, but that's what we're doing. And if it doesn't work out, doesn't work out. Uh, we know our shepherd will lead us to the right pasture. All right. So I am going to wrap it up there. The John chapter 10 continues on. There's so many, there's a repetition of the, the concept of I'm good shepherd, uh, again, and the sheep hear my voice. And I just want to encourage you. If you do belong to the flock, you will hear his voice. Uh, one of the things we do need to do is train ourselves to hear him and, and what that means is be a Berean. You know, if somebody is, is sharing something with you from the scriptures or something about anything, go and search the truth. Okay, take it with a grain of salt. They're not perfect. The sermon comes up. Don't just listen to that and say, oh, this is it. Even if someone says in Matthew, oh, in Matthew chapter 25, verse 3, it says, even if I do that here, like pause the video, go look at Matthew 25, verse 3. See that I said it right. Even one of the commentaries is looking at at one point, he said Ezekiel 37. The next point, he said Ezekiel 27. So I went to go look up Ezekiel 27, and it was the wrong verse. And I was like, oh, what? then I was like, oh, it's Ezekiel 37. He, there's a typo there. We can make mistakes, right? Sometimes mistakes aren't, you know, nefarious, but um, they're there, right? So if someone is speaking, one of the ways you start to learn the voice of your Savior, your shepherd, versus the voice of others is to take the time to check others and what we have for that is the Spirit of God. And we have the scriptures to look at uh, so we can read. And we can we have prayer. And then we have the community. We can talk to each other and say, hey, what do you think? And eventually the voice of your shepherd will become clearer and rise above all the other voices. And that's what uh, is hap has happened for me is you can hear the voice of, uh, hear his voice clearly. Uh, and then to be able to study scriptures and hear his voice clearly and to pray, to hear his voice clearly and to pray for people and to know his voice, which is something he is striving for, for the whole world to know his voice. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and in there because I got another idea in my head that I want to share. Uh, but you know what? I should because it clarifies just the idea of diaspora. The disciples went out to Berea. I said that and I kind of chased that 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 trail. But uh, that was their method of missions. You know, they went to all the different synagogues throughout the world. And that's how Thomas ended up in India and Kerala, the state that my my people are from. There was a there's a Jewish synagogue there and it's still there in the city of Kochi. Uh, and um, and so Thomas went there to seek out the diaspora, to seek out the lost ones of Israel, the ones that have been spread out into other nations. I can imagine like him going there and they speak Malayalam or you know, the iteration of it from back then. And then they probably received it. And then he, now it was kind of the, the thing was like, if the synagogue receives, okay. And then they would go out to the Gentiles in the area, right? That was their point. But first was to seek the flock of Israel. And so I think that's really important that we all, something we need to all pray about is to how to reconnect, kind of go back that way, reconnect with, with the sheep of Israel, because 
they still feel scattered. They still feel spread out. I know there's a lot of Messianic believers and there's a whole community and they're doing good work and they're in Israel and, and, and they're sharing the gospel. And so there are believers in Jesus and they have their own name there. I forget what it's called. Uh, and those efforts are growing. But if you can find a way to support that just by reading about it or looking it up or wherever the voice of this your shepherd leads you, it's a it's a good thing. Um, anyway, okay, so I'm done. Thank you again for watching. Um, like and subscribe. Excuse me. Like and subscribe. Follow on Twitch. Like and subscribe on 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 YouTube, uh, and share with your friends, your family, anyone you think would benefit from this kind of teaching that will enjoy it. And uh, and just a reminder, like if if you are watching this on YouTube, I am live streaming this every day at 11 a.m. The purpose of a live stream is so that if people want to chime in they have thoughts they have ideas you can you can you can jump on the chat there's a chat function on twitch you can you can uh you can sh you can share your ideas and thoughts and just and we can have a conversation more of like a, an active bible study and so i know 11 a.m people are at work or whatever but if you are home that's the time to do it uh and and so you can do that so you go to twitch twitch is t w i t c h twitch dot tv slash mental health and scriptures or you can just google mental health and scriptures twitch and it'll probably lead you to landing page and you can follow there and know when we go live uh, again the live feature is to see if we can build a community of people who want to study the scriptures together and also talk about mental health so i would love to do that and at 6 p.m we have our live stream gaming it's mostly consistent um sometimes and i do that with my daughter uh and try to talk about some of this stuff in a practical way with her uh and and you know she's seven so sometimes uh, she doesn't want to do it and and so if i can do it on my own i'll do it on my own or maybe my wife will join me but that's at 6 p.m and that's that's us playing video games but also trying to talk about about some of this subject so it's really great i think if you have younger children or or whatever age they are, they like gaming. They don't mind watching someone playing video games, uh, but then you also want them to be listening to something beneficial. That's what the purpose of that is for at 6 p.m. Okay. Thank you again for watching and God bless and uh, happy Monday and looking forward to Shavuot, the festival of weeks.